Okay, well, I mean, we'll start with kind of big picture stuff. You know, you've been in government for a long time, one, two decades now. I mean, yeah, sure. tell us about, I mean, people that we've met say that no one knows Guyana like you do. Tell us about the place that Guyana is in right now. So to understand where we are in, you have to understand where we, we have come from. Um, in the 90s, Guyana was an undemocratic country. Um, we had been undemocratic for almost three decades. And um, with the help of the international community, President Carter Sr., President Bush, and many others, um, we had returned to democracy in 1992. Um, the Caribbean Council of Churches came in that period and they did an assessment of Guyana and they said there was an era of hopelessness because people didn't have freedom. Um, the economy was, they assessed us to be below 80. We had lost about maybe half of our population. They migrated, they fled the country, mainly to the United States. And um, just to give you a small picture of what we we took over at that time, uh, the debt, um, the foreign debt was over 900% of GDP. And um, to service that debt, we were using 153% of revenue. So it was a bankrupt country. To, to tell you about the figures today, um, we're, our debt is now 40% of GDP and it's coming lower. And that's even pre-oil and um, we're using about 5% of revenue to service debt. Um, the country's um, gross domestic product has expanded maybe 15-fold. Um, more people are employed um, and we're excited about the future. We have a plan that's, um, that will take us hopefully to an upper middle income country in this decade. Where do you see Guyana's position on the global stage and how is that changing? Um, we don't worry ourselves too much about where we are in the global stage. We have a task here, which is to change our country for the benefit of our people. But you're absolutely right. Um, since we found oil, there has been a new found interest in Guyana. And um, part particularly in that sector, and so increasingly, I think we are dragged into playing a greater role in, in the global arena. As you said, you know, Guyana has recently discovered oil and with that has come, you know, ushering in a large scale development projects as well as other contracts. I mean, is it possible for Guyana to do all of that and to you know, develop and become more developed whilst maintaining your natural resources? <coughs> Yes, absolutely. Um, we, when we launched our low carbon development strategy um, in 2009, uh, many people thought that uh, it's not worn out, it wasn't going anywhere. And it was designed to, first of all, to demonstrate to the world that there could be a non polluting path to development. And, it was essential that we created a development strategy of that nature because people legitimately want to prosper in the country. You can't tell them that, you know, you, if you don't have electricity, like in many, many parts of Africa and India, millions of people, tens of millions of people don't have electricity, that we want a zero, zero carbon world. And to achieve a zero carbon world, you have to remain without electricity forever. So we had to say to Guyanese, we want to deploy our forests in service of the world, but we are not going to um, do so in a manner that will affect your legitimate right to prosper and to achieve you know, what you want to in this world. So launching that development strategy was crucial. And now we've just relaunched it, the, the low carbon development strategy. We, we believe that you can find a balance. And to, to do that, I have to 
probably go into a little explanation um, ab about why we believe that this is so. Now, the, the world will need in 2050 in a net zero carbon uh, scenario, 24 million barrels of oil per day. So it's not that we are going to stop producing oil, oil entirely in a net, net zero um, carbon world. This was based on the assessment recently done. We want to be, our oil is light sweet crude and we are low cost, relatively low cost producer. We want to be part of that energy mix. We have seen recently the move by the United States and Europe to block all fossil fuel related investments across the world. And we've been making this argument that if, you, if they were to do so now, what they're effectively doing, they're effectively creating a monopoly for the existing producers. The United States, Norway, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela. Because the world will still need fossil fuel. And if there can be no new exploration or development, then these are the, the countries that are producing now, they will they will supply the market. Countries like Guyana, Suriname, and countries in Africa that have recently discovered oil would be excluded from this. And so our argument is that we need this more than you do. Our per capita GDP now is $6,000. In the United States, it's $72,000. Why should we not produce oil here? I know, um, particularly when the developed world has used up almost all of its allowance, if, if there is anything, if there is any justice in this, its allowance in producing, um, in, in emission, in, because of historical emissions. Mm -hmm. I think the, the difference now in the future, the, the remaining balance should come to the developing world. So we believe we can, we can produce fossil fuel we support a carbon price, a strong carbon price. We support early decarbonization of the world. We support a net zero by 2050. In fact, we are already net zero in Guyana because our forest is, is a huge sink. So we're not withdrawing from our global commitments. We want to see the world produce less fossil fuel as quickly as possible. But once there is a market fit, we want to be part of that market. I mean, yeah, as you said, you know, reaching net zero by 2050 doesn't necessarily mean, or it doesn't mean at all that you know, there's not going to be fossil fuels um, uh, produced. But I mean, when it comes to the position that Guyana is in right now, do you feel like there is a window of opportunity where you need to be taking advantage of that? Yes, and, and we say this openly. We say this openly that we should get as much of the resources out of the ground now, ensure that it's used properly for future growth and in terms of savings, because this window will not be there forever. And so we, yes, there is that urgency mm -hmm. at this point in time. Is it difficult not to exploit Guyana's rainforests when, you know, there's a clear monetary value on things like timber, things like gold, and there's not necessarily on keeping the clean rainforest? We, we tried to demonstrate this point many years ago. Um, the, the world believes that you can save tropical rainforests through acts of philanthropy. And they don't see that there is an economic value to these assets. So in, two, in 2007, we got McKinsey and company to come to Guyana and we looked at the precisely the point you're making. What if we were hypothetically, what if we just keep 10% of the rainforest um, with the high, highest biodiversity value? And over a 25 years period, we were to deforest the rest and convert the forest into mining and large scale agriculture, uh, et cetera. How much value on an annual basis, we could yield as a country. And 
and we came up with an annuity. We said, if we will probably need about 600 million US dollars at that time to outcompete the alternate use of the forest. So we said, if the world, this for the forest in, in Guyana, which is the size of England, and and stores about 19 giga, gigatons of um, carbon in it. If the world believes that this asset must be preserved, there has to be some alternate economic value that comes to us to outcompete the other use, um, the alternate use for the for the forest. And that is why we started building the model around this. And we, we had the largest per capita forest carbon trading scheme in the world when we signed an agreement with Norway for $250 million. We are not pleased how forest carbon has been treated around the world. The, the three biggest sources of emission globally would be burning fossil fuel for transport, for energy, and deforestation and land and land use. Those account for more than 90% of total emissions in the world. So a lot of attention has been paid on fossil fuel globally, and the carbon trading schemes have been established, et cetera, for, to, to deal with those, the two other um, sources of emission. But nothing has been done in a major way for forests. And our argument is that you could never achieve net zero by 2050 if you don't address uh, the, one of the primary sources of emission, which accounts about 16% of global emission, that is forest change, forest and land use change. Mm -hmm. but, but just look at what recently came out of the last COP. The world leaders got together and they had a pledge made um, by got the developing world to sign on to a pledge to stop um, for the deforestation by 2030, not back by money. And in until now, forest carbon cannot be used in the offset market. So we have to go to voluntary markets. So there's no attention being paid to this source of emission. And I suspect largely because it, the, it exists in the developing world. There is an inherent discrimination, I believe, in, in having money flow to the developing world um, to address critical issues dealing with clim cli climate change. We, we have seen how the Kyoto Protocol has changed the core principle, the justice principle, from common but differentiated responsibility now it has been changed to, to common burden sharing. And so we see that reflected here again. So my point is that we can preserve the forest, we're committed, but there has to be incentives to do so. And it ha the incentives have to outcompete the alternate use of the forest. Or these countries, often very poor countries, would want to utilize the forest to enhance the well-being of their people, legitimately so. I've gone to many countries in Africa. When, before I left office as president, um, they, I, we had a meeting of heads of state in Africa, and they asked me to be the roving ambassador for the three forest basins. And I visited many villages where a single tree could feed in Africa maybe a hundred families for two months. If they don't cut that tree, they don't have food on their table. For them, it's an existential issue. And no, they don't worry about future climate change. And particularly when they see the developed world being very convenient about their targets. Look at, look at their, fossil, um, their issue with fossil fuel. Before the last COP, they said, oh, we shouldn't even produce gas. We were told not to develop our gas resources because the assets would be stranded. And, you know, it's not consistent with a net zero scenario. And 
And immediately thereafter, when the gas prices skyrocketed, we saw the same countries and the same governments arguing for more gas to be produced and now trying to reclassify um, gas as green. Um, so, so, so in preserving forests, I'm coming back to, to Guyana, in preserving forests, and the developed world has to understand that it cannot be done through philanthropy or declarations. There has to be the same incentives that are put in place to ca cause decarbonization in the energy sector. Those incentives have to be available to the developing world in which these forests are located to outcompete the alternate use for the forest. If that doesn't happen, there will be enormous pressures on the governments and the people who live in these forests to continue um, keeping the forest intact. Speaking of the people who live in the forest, I mean, since coming here, we've spoken to a number of indigenous people who yeah. are very concerned that what they see as their land mm -hmm. is being handed out to companies and those companies are going to use and extract from that land. And that's going to have um, and is having significant environmental impact, is having significant impact on their own lives. Are you doing enough to protect indigenous people? Yeah, but I'm, I'm a bit surprised by this because we, if you look at the land policy of the government, when, when we assumed office in 1992, Indigenous people had title lands, about 6% of Guyana. By the time we left office in 2015, um, and now we were, um, they, they, we had titled Indigenous communities um, with, with land that amounted to over 14% of Guyana, the whole of the country. So from 6% to 14%, that is our track record. We passed a law in Parliament, the Amerindian Act, that sets out specific conditions for processing new requests for land and obligated the government to respond within a time frame. We have restarted the land titling program. So we, we believe that ultimately we about 20% of Guyana, the total country, will be Amerindian title lands, and and we're we're on in in the process of ensuring that that happens. Considering our Amerindian population is like probably about ten percent of the country, so that's one. Two, we're one of the few countries in the world that give the Amerindian communities on title lands subsurface rights. So they had rights over the forest, but never the mineral, mineral below, below ground. So now they have subsurface rights in, in, as part of the, the legislation that we passed. We put in place our con, in our constitution an Indigenous Peoples Commission. We established a Ministry of Amerindian Affairs. We now have about 4,000 Indigenous people who are in government working integrated in government as a policeman, etc. We have several members of parliament in the past that were Amerindians. In 2001, we had a single Amerindian doctor. Now we have probably close to 200. And that's medical doctors. We now have a health facility in every village, the 215 villages in the country. So our track record on indigenous people is a very strong one, and particularly our government, more than 75% of the Amerindian people voted for us, although they had an indigenous party that campaigned, I, get, uh, I know, more than 75%. So I, I, I've never heard about anyone specifically saying this is our land and we're giving it to a, a foreign company. In fact, we have um, we have moved forward on the land issue like no other country in this hemisphere or even globally in a, in a short historical period of time. We compare our track records with the developed world and many countries, including the say Australia or Canada. We have a more progressive 
policy than the indigenous people than any of these countries. Well, so for example, I mean, this week we went to the area of Morawa, which, you know, indigenous people are living on. They are currently surrounded by you know, concessions that have been handed out for logging and mining. You know, they're vulnerable to both the impacts that that's having on them currently, as well as the prospects for what, happen, what might happen in the future. Yeah, sure. I mean, what would you say to them? Yes, but the thing is that a lot of these concessions are historically handed out. Indigenous people do mining too. Many of them individually have mining sure. contracts, they have forestry contracts. You can, if, if, you, if you're analyzing a country and its treatment of indigenous people and the treatment of the core issues, you have to look at whether their rights have been enhanced fundamentally and their access to land. I just told you about titles now, which is land. 14% of Guyana moving up from 6% of Ghana. We've always gonna have issues with conflicts on the ground that these have to be resolved periodically. But I, we deal with a system for moving um, like indigenous people's rights forward. Um, so, so their involvement at, at every level. Once a year, the president meets with all of the indigenous leaders. They have direct access to the president. Very few countries have that, that in the world. So in my, my view, our treatment of indigenous people, if you assess it globally and in the big parameters, yes, it would rank in the top tier. Now, whether we'd have individual problems on the ground in many communities, the answer is yes. It happens in every country. But if you're going to, to, to characterize a country's treatment of indigenous people, based on the occasional problems you, you have all the time. And I don't want to say that this happened, but this typically happens when people come in from abroad and, and they interview, they always try to make the country look like backwater. They don't look at the key policy achievements of the country. They go and find one person on the street who will say, oh no, I don't like this. And then that becomes the story. If people really want to understand developing world, they have to immerse themselves a bit more. Like the lectures we get now on, from spending our, our sovereign wealth fund from the globe. Oh, can you spend it? Will you be corrupt? And all of that sort of thing. They, this is a developed world perspective of, of small countries. It's very, it's very um, disparaging and condescending. I'm not saying it's Which with your interview. I'm not talking about one or two individuals. I'm yeah, about yes, but, but then that's why you have to look at the policy. I'm trying to get you to look at policy making and how that has changed over a period, a very difficult period for a country, and how that has, has changed. And that is the key issue. In Parliament, we went and created an Amerindian Act when there was none. We gave, in that act, we, we gave the communities greater self-government, um, which they were asking for, subsurface rights, um, greater access to forested lands, and a pathway to getting title lands, which was a major advance on the rest of the world. If you show me countries go through around the world and can show me two countries that have a better act than the one we have, I'll concede the point to you. And then in terms of integration with our society or, or preventing age old discrimination, because indigenous people live mainly in the forested areas, the outlying areas. You can see how if you track the migration of resources to those communities, you will see how major it has been in terms of access to health care and education services. There was one time in our country when indigenous people, children, they, they, the maximum they could have achieved in the education sector was primary education because there were no schools, secondary schools or tertiary institutions in the hinterland. I mean, it's still the case for some people. Right. What we have done now, we can't put a secondary school in a community with 250 persons. Or, or so. So we have built secondary schools in the key areas like Aishalton, Letem, Santa Rosa, Mabaruma, 
paramagnetoid. We build dormitories in these, in these schools. So when the primary schools, the kids can, can then come from the primary schools, go to secondary school there because you have a critical mass. They stay in dormitories that are funded by the government and then there are scholarships. This is a huge difference now. So indigenous kids now can, can go into university because they can get a secondary education. They have access now. And so it's not going to be perfect. We came from, I told you already, uh, we came from a situation where 153% of revenue was used to service debt. And we had to work our way out of that. Secondly, we are still a country with a per capita GDP of 6,000 US dollars. So our, there are limitations to a lot of the, what we can do, but you see clear intent here. And, and that is why I'm so proud of our record of achievement in these areas. I can, we can't even communicate much in an interview, but I can go through detailly all of the steps that have been taken. Um, I want to move on to the business side of things. Um, you know, Guyana has attracted a lot of foreign investment. Sure. What is it that Guyana has to offer? Well, the opportunity to make money. That, that is why people are coming here. And um, so that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, simple. Yeah. I mean, what, what in terms of, you know, what kind of opportunities are here for, you know, why, why would nations come here? Why would companies come here? Why would individuals come here to invest rather than elsewhere? Well, well, first of all, you have a government that is, um, that will ensure that the environment is created for private sector development. Um, there was a time, too, in the 30 years, when the state owned and controlled practically everything. 80% of the economy was owned and controlled by the state. So, so when we took office, it was not just the fact that all the macro and fundamentals were wrong. We had a fiscal deficit that was 25% of GDP, a balance of payment deficit, 50% of GDP, the huge debt overhang, high inflation. But also there was another fact that people don't recognize very much. We didn't have a private sector because the state had been so dominant in the economy for three decades that we did not have a local private sector. And we struggled because we had a bad reputation as being an undemocratic country, anti-private sector, and insular. So we could not, in the early days, attract a lot of foreign capital into the country. And we didn't have an, a local private sector. So in the two decades or so, we have had to build an indigenous private sector. And today, we are vibrant young, thriving, and very aggressive. And we're proud of that. And we have had to spend time establishing a track record that will treat international capital fairly. So we pass some constitutional guarantees against nationalization <laughs> and, and about allowing free repatriation of capital and profits and dividends and that sort of thing. We created an environment that was conducive to private sector growth. So we saw an increase in private sector investment because of the incentive regime, the environment, more predictable environment for private sector development, and then the development of the local private sector. And then when we found oil and gas, then that saw an avalanche of like new investors coming here because it's it's investment of a different scale so we we have seen many of them coming in to work not just in oil and gas but to it has had an impact on the rest of the economy we've had a hard time building um just to give you an example a hotel um the the Marriott Hotel is fully owned by the government. We did not want the government to own a hotel, but we could not get an investor to come and build a second hotel. The Pegasus was built in the 60s. So the government started a project. Now we're looking to sell, sell it out, get into the private sector. But 
with in the next two years we'll have about over maybe 12 new international hotels being built in the country yeah we still want to Right, so there will be about 12 new international hotels starting. So the oil and gas, because of the enhanced in, the interest in the country, is dragging the other sectors up rapidly. Um, the retail trade, the services industry, like manufacturing, all are having uh, uh, some, some impact uh, um, because of, of the oil and gas fine. So as I said before, the investors are here now because they see an opportunity to make money. We want people who come here to do well. We want them to prosper. We want our people to share that prosperity. We don't want them to be excluded. And, do and you, that do is you why- we share that prosperity? I mean, is there such a no, thing as a win-win? No, I mean, no, because right now we're right? starting, and that is precisely why we started off with a local content policy. Many countries that have been producing oil and gas. When you travel to those countries, you see the oil and gas people, they're mainly foreigners, they live almost in enclaves. Yes, the oil cuts. You're right, yes. And, and um, the locals, they're just, they're not part of any of the supply chain to these so how, agencies. How are regular Guyanese people, not just people at the top, but regular Guyanese the, people benefiting? So this? that is why. So we've just started. We made it clear. We were in opposition. We got in back government last uh, in 2020, August 2020. And we made it clear in our manifesto that we have to have a local content legislation. In December last year, we passed a local content legislation. In 40 sectors, we've had car votes where the companies have to, to recruit only Guyanese or Guyanese companies to provide goods and services in these areas at different percentages. That will make a huge difference to the local companies and local people because um, even we saw some of the companies, one company was bringing in water from the U.S., we have companies producing local water. Now they are obligated to buy their, their um, supplies from Guyanese companies, food, um, rental of buildings. Just to give you an idea, you probably need about 5,000 new dwellings, either apartments or homes for rent. Um, they, that would almost go exclusively to Guyanese companies and Guyanese individuals. So they, can, they would feel the benefit at that level. You don't have another mechanism except through the employment and the, the ability to supply goods and services to the oil company, except government expenditure. And government expenditure now has to be carefully managed so that we don't have, you know, the Dutch disease. We don't change relative prices. So although you see us, uh, this is the first budget with oil revenue in it that we're now debating you will see that the capital budget has grown by over 100% from last year, the last budget. But the recurrent expenditure only by 10%, less than 10%. Because we've seen the mistakes of many other countries where when they get resources, they splurge, and they splurge on the recurrent account of the, the budget. And when the oil money goes, they're stuck with these expenditures because they, they come up every year. So we, the capital budget has grown significantly and that's largely because we wanna create the infrastructure of the future that will generate more jobs and help to diversify our economy. So the highways, the bridges, the roads, the incentives to, to business and then the hospitals. This year we are starting seven new major hospitals around the country um, we're moving to free education at the university level. Um, we already started a scholarship program, even without the oil money last year, but it's going to grow for 20,000 Guyanese, you know, so that they can start benefiting directly from the oil proceeds. And, but, but indirectly through public expenditure, because it helps the health on the healthcare, improving healthcare and access to education, which are crucial sectors for us. So you're confident that the whole country is going to benefit from this increased surge in foreign investment here? Yeah, 
it's not going to happen immediately. But yes, over time, and that is why the government has to ensure that the money is spent in a, in a manner that helps people, not di not direct um, cash, maybe uh, because some people want cash immediately, and it's not a whole lot of money. They they um, like I saw the newspaper said budget fuel by by oil money and it's only one fifth of the budget that has been financed by the oil and gas resources just one fifth and when you look at how much money we collect on an annual basis in the initial years right now because there's this mistaken impression that we are washed with money now that will happen in the outer years but right now when you look at it in relation to our total revenue, it's a fraction of it, tiny fraction. But already people believe that you should spend more than what you're collecting. And we have to resist that and talk to people because expectations have been fewer. You know, everyone here is a look at a report from abroad and Bloomberg or wherever, and they see a country awash with oil money. The actual flow to the government from the royalty and from the profit oil, when you look at the, the magnitude of it, it's small compared to the budget and to the needs of the country. And, and, and so a lot of our work is making sure that pe ensuring that people have the, the nuanced expectations, nuanced expectations so that they don't expect tomorrow we're all going to get one one television commentator every day say we we're rich we should stop working now everybody should get a check from the government you know from the oil money and we're far from that we have to work even harder now we have to work even harder if we want to achieve what we want for our country and our people now that the oil resources are in it's even more work so what are some of the big infrastructure projects that you have in the works or you have planned at the moment to go ahead? Well, the, definitely the gas project, bringing some of the gas to generate power. Um, uh, because power is critical, electricity is critical. The cost per kilowatt hour is about 30 US cents. Um, that's really, really high. And we cannot develop a manufacturing industry with those costs. Or it's a burden that our private sector faces. And then it's very burdensome on people too in their homes. So we made a commitment to cut the price of electricity by 50%. You can only do so with renewable energy and with the gas to, to power plant. So we have now, we've laid out our energy a plan for the next five years and we're going to triple our install capacity and still cut emissions by 70 percent through a mix of gas hydropower and solar and so on the hydropower on, on hydro where um, blackstone was developing this project um that the last government killed, it was a US company. They'd gone out to tender, selected a contractor, a Chinese contractor, and, um, and then the project died. So we have retended the same contractor that Blackstone is, um, that they had hired. They now retender, but they have all of the, the material, etc. So now we're in negotiation. They came in on the bid, they had the lowest price. It was nearly three US cents lower than when we were going per kilowatt hour with, with Blackstone. We don't have to take equity in the project. We're we'll buy, buying power if the agreement, the negotiations go well there. So that is, that will be about 7.7 .7 cents per kilowatt hour. We can then sell it at double the price we're buying it for and still meet our commitment to cut electricity prices by half. 
So it's very exciting. And then on the solar side, we, we have had a 5 million US dollars sitting at the IDB to do between 30 to 50 megawatts. So in the next five years, you're gonna see us triple install capacity, cut our emissions by 70% and lower the cost of electricity by 50% in that. How do you decide which companies get granted these, you know, some of these big infrastructure projects like hydro tender, power, tender. Like, like the roads, like bridges? They tender, they go through a tendering process. We're not like a backwater country, you know. We, we go through a tendering process. And how open is that process? The process is like open as open as any part of the world. You put out a tender, it's in the newspapers, it's in television, it's advertised everywhere, and people put in their tender. There's a public opening of the tender, and then it's adjudicated. When I was president, unlike many countries in the Caribbean and in the Commonwealth, I removed the cabinet from the award of contracts so cabinet now only issues and no objection. In many countries, the cabinet approves the project. We, a cabinet in Guyana cannot um, approve a project. They have to give a no objection, only no objection to the technical um, document. And then if they withhold the no objection, they have to say why, which is a huge advance on many countries that surround us and in the Commonwealth. And also, the contract has the right of appeal. So if they don't, if they're not pleased with the adjudication of the war, they can appeal. If they're not pleased with the appeal, then they can go to the courts in Guyana. And our highest court now is the Caribbean Court of Justice. So it's an external court. So they can go all the way up, up there. Which countries are the biggest investors in Guyana? Um, well, the United States now I don't, it's the oil and gas industry, but the Exxon, the, the, that project is really made up of Hess, Sinok, a Chinese company, and Exxon Mobil. So really, they're the biggest investors now, but in a single company in the oil and gas, in the oil and gas sector. Um, the Can Canadians had historically been in the mining sector, gold mining, um, they had been the major, major investors in Guyana. We have some Chinese companies, but um, not as major investors at this point in time. Well, I mean, you do have, you know, some of the biggest infrastructure projects you have are being built by Chinese state-run companies. I mean, you've got the Demira Harbour Bridge, which is worth $256 million. You've got the hydroelectric project, which is worth a lot. Um, you've got a long highway worth 200 million. You've got a road upgrade that didn't work another 200 million. Which, which you, long highway? Your, your, which long highway is this? Uh, this is the, from Shunar to Pakia. Worth 200 million dollars. 200 million Guyana dollars. That's a uh, 1 US million, dollars. 1 million, 1, 1 million US dollar. What is it? That's 200 million Guyana dollars. I believe this is in US dollars. No, no, no. We don't have a highway like that being built in Ghana from where? Shulina? Shuna to Pakia. No, nothing of that sort. And you've got a road upgrade from Anandale to Mahaika? Yeah. Worth $200 million? Right. No, no, no. That's worth, um, that was about $46 million. That's the East Coast Highway. Okay, well, I can check those figures. Yeah, so the figures are wrong. Okay. So. So let me go I mean, through. I, I guess my question is, yes. also, so, your, your government has also said that it could take out as much as $1.5 billion in loans yeah. for China built infrastructure. Yeah, sure. Why is it that China is so keen on okay. developing and, and investing sure. in China? So, but let's get back to the projects first, because a lot of this, the, this gets wrong. A well, lot I will, I will about check, the figures. The figures, the figures are not address, accurate. So let me, you mentioned the Demarar, no, you mentioned the Demarar Harbor Bridge, but we went to open public tender. So companies from around the world, they bid, and in the final bid, they had the lowest price bid. So we went to open public tender, and companies from all around the world, from Europe, et cetera, they, bid, they all bid the project. So that's an open process. Secondly, the same thing with the hydro. We, we had Brazilian companies bidding, companies from other parts of the world, the Chinese company offered 7.7 .7 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, this was way below other Chinese companies too. 
um, when Blackstone was developing the, the, the project, they, had a, they were looking at a power purchase um, agreement of over 10 cents per kilowatt hour. And we had to, we had to take equity of $100 million in the project. So that's not a loan. We're buying power. In this case, there is no loan. Uh, you supply the electricity, we buy the power at that, at that price. The, the road I suspect the 200 million you're talking about is from Mabu Linden to Mabura Hill. It's a project funded partly by the British government and the Caribbean Development Bank. Now, the Ch Chinese are part of the Caribbean Development Bank, so their contractors can bid on projects funded by the Caribbean Development Bank. They, they bid and the Brazilian company won it. It is not a Chinese company. The Brazilian company won the bid for that project, the 200 million US project. So it, that is why the East Coast Road, that started about eight, nine years. If you drive down the highway, it's 40 something million dollars. And it's the, it was the, on the highway. Now, the reason in many cases is because when the interest rate was 8% globally, um, the Chinese uh, uh, finance, when it's Exim Bank finance, not the China Development Bank, it was coming in at just 1%. So it was very attractive for countries like ours because when you look at the pay, repayment over the period, you end up on the, if you were to take a loan from a Western institution, it will be, you pay more than double the price of the, the project. So they're offering so, better terms. Better terms. That has changed recently. So now we have Europeans who are, the European um, banks that are offering better fixed term rate than Chinese financing and therefore they're gonna lose out on many of these contracts, many of the contracts in the future. And I think that was partly because Europe put, is, set aside, is setting aside a fund and uh, that came out of the, I think the G7, the G7 meeting, but now the terms are, are better. So we are working with, with an Austrian company that will see a fixed, fixed interest um, loan for one of the hospitals that would be significantly lower than some, some others, Ch China financing, Chinese financing. So you don't think that China has an outside role in its engagement in Ghana? No, no, and all, we welcome all countries here, but there is no political string attached to any, any company's involvement here. And there is no, no doubt that China um, is playing a big role uh, globally, but we don't, um, there is no political string attached to the development of projects. We ensure that the, the rigorous analysis is done, that we're getting the most competitive offer for the country. Ultimately, that matters. And then we get good quality work. Too. We get good quality work. That is all, also very important for us. I mean, you say there's no political strings attached, but in February last year, the Taiwanese government announced that they'd be establishing a Taiwan office in Guyana. Within 24 hours, your government declared its continued support for the One China policy and terminated any agreement with Taiwan. Why is that? Because they, this originated from the ministry, it didn't go to the cabinet, but the entire world supports the One China policy. What is so different about Guyana? The entire world. Why did you pull out of the office? No, because, so because imagine in the United States of America that at a junior level, the State Department, without clearing with the White House, decides to change the, the One China policy. Imagine if that were to happen, and then you find out about that from the newspapers, what will happen? And that is what happened in Guyana. I don't understand what you're uh, that at the level of the foreign ministry, this was decided, and not at the level of the cabinet of the country. There's a president, an executive president, and he has a cabinet. And the cabinet is responsible for policy. And so we do not, we do not, we subscribe to the one China policy. You tell me how many countries in the world do not subscribe to that. 
Why is it any different in Guyana? Well, I guess and why it does seems that, like yeah. it seems like a very abrupt turnaround, or at least a very abrupt. But I just explained to you why. It seems like a very abrupt yeah. announcement of your support for the One China policy and suddenly terminating. Yes, but that I, I just explained to you why that it was done at a tiering government where they're not authorized to change a policy at the national level. The president and the cabinet. They're responsible for policy making in Guyana. So you're saying that you weren't aware of the Taiwan right. office? Right. No, no, that the approval to grant a Taiwan office with, we made it clear, Taiwan can come and do business here. But to give a, a diplomatic sort of recognition to Taiwan, we, we are unprepared to do that. Like that? many countries have done. Why you ask me why, the, you ask 190 countries in the world why? Because well, historically, historically, that is our position. We believe with the United Nations, we believe in the one China policy. And when we change that to the UN, we're, we're, we are believers, we're believers in multilateralism. So when the United States uh, or the, the United Nations changes our view, we probably would, would evolve our views too. But we like to be part of the global community. Uh, that that is good enough reason for us being part of the global community. I think we're in good company. I mean, obviously, Taiwan's independence is a very contentious issue for for China as yeah. well as the U.S. I mean, do you? China has been known to pressure brands, countries, people, individuals to support the One China policy to denounce Taiwan. Is that what happened? No, but no, but we. It's not like they had to to pressure us to do that. We've supported the One China policy from time immemorial, from the time we established diplomatic relations. And so too has the world. In this case, you had a change that was authorized at a level that was not approved by the president and the cabinet. And that is the only policy making level in the country. And therefore, that was reversed. That, that is all that happened. I mean, the U.S. State Department issued uh, a statement applauding the Taiwan office in Guyana. And obviously, you yeah. know, given the contentious issues between the U.S. and China, does it ever feel like Guyana is being used as a pawn with it, you know, within these two global superpowers? Um, I don't. I don't think we're such a big player to have the arrogance to think that we're so important to the two parties to be used as a pawn. I think we're just a small country trying to do the best for our people. And um, they, these countries will have their geopolitical interests. We have shared values um, with many parts of the, the world. We want to remain friendly with all the countries of the world. We don't want to sell ourselves to anyone. We just want to make sure that we do what's right for our country and our people. So we, we suffered a lot from the geopolitical games um, that led a lot to the division of our people along ethnic lines um, in the 60s. You know, when the world was worried that Guyana could become a second Cuba, there was a direct intervention in Guyanese politics by the CIA and others and the British Secret Service. And they... Um, they, we had a lot of problems in that period in the 60s. Um, the ethnic problems started there because they divided our people. And then, and then we were stuck with a dictatorship for almost three decades because of that. So we, we've suffered enough from geopolitics to not to want to be part of all of the shenanigans behind it. We're very conscious that their people are globally trying to retain spheres of influence or carve out new spheres of influence. But we, um, we want to do what is best for our country and we want to remain friendly with everyone. I mean, not long after you terminated the Taiwan office, let's say, I mean, China made a $1.5 billion US dollar loan available to Guyana. We spoke to several influential people who are very connected to the Chinese embassy who said that that loan was as a reward for breaking diplomacy. No, but Taiwan. that's totally false because 
we had started a programming exercise. When we go through the entire country, we look at their public sector investment program. We then say, which are the agencies we're going to approach to finance the projects? So some will be financed from revenue, government revenue, and then some will be financed from the multilateral agencies. So we then go to the Caribbean Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, and then we have gaps. And then at the bilateral level, we try to fill those gaps by approaching various agencies, loan agencies. So it could be maybe from the European Fund or the Chinese. So long before that incident took place, we had said that we, are, we want to look at several projects that could amount to this sum of money. The Amila Fall was part of it. So let me make it clear. There is no loan offer from China for $1.5 billion, and we never requested a $1.5 billion in loan. So what, what happened is we were looking at access from their banks. So take, for example, if the hydro is $700 million, the Chinese company will get the money. They, the only interaction we're, we're having with them is buying power. We're not taking a loan from China for $700 million. They are going to supply the electricity to us. And we, if they supply, we pay. If they don't supply, we don't pay. We don't, we don't have a loan on our books for that. So this is, um, this is the falsehood that's going on. I don't know where you got that we, they offered us 1.5 billion. In fact, we're pressing them to get some more money and they're not, they, they, they don't want to, to give us because we want to get more money from the Exim Bank, which is a lower cost, cost um, financing than, than the, China, the, the China Development Bank. So I've seen this in the news circles about they are offering us a $1.5 billion. We, 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 um, we addressed that issue a long time ago. I'm surprised. Um, we, I don't want to get into anti-China hysteria, um, but, we, but I know the issue is important geopolitically and all of that about China's role in the region. But, uh, but a lot of these things are not true. If you actually look at their, their facilities. So, the, for example, on the bridge, you mentioned the bridge. The number one ranked company, we, we said we'll start the negotiations with a number one ranked company, a Chinese company. We've just terminated the, the negotiations with them because the cost of financing is too high. We, and, and that has just happened. And we've moved to now the second ranked company so because which is that company? The, I don't I don't know the details, but the second rank company. So because we'd have to get the cost down. So it doesn't mean that if you come in with high cost financing, it, you're going to automatically get the, the, the project. Uh, so let me just make it clear again. There is no one point five billion dollars loan from China that the government of China of offered of us. Prior to that, we were looking for about $1.5 billion of access through multiple facilities. And that included the hydro, but the hydro now has come off our books because we are not financing the hydro. So that will not be part of our, our debt structure. And this year, Guyana dropped two points on the Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, which puts it among the most corrupt in the region. Do you accept that within this government and within this country there is a problem with corruption? Yes. Um, first of all, I have a problem with the indices, but we do have real corruption in countries like ours too. So I, I believe a lot of these. One time, I, I think this is called, this is like a blackness index. The darker you are, the lower you are on the index. The, the developed countries hardly ever get on this index. And, and they have more institutional corruption in my view. When you have a lobbying system where people can lobby for policies 
I think that's the most corrupt act in a government. You can get people to lobby and pay lobbyists, and it's accepted right, to get but, policy but passed. Guyana, yes, Guyana, so, so yes, so I'm, 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 I'm talking about that. So first of all, it's a perception index. So they always perceive developing countries as, as, as corrupt. Now, who do you speak to? Where does the perception come from? So there, it, it's absolutely... Well, the people, clearly Guyanese people... Right, yes, but, but exactly. So this is who you speak to. Because when you come to a country, you can easily go to TIGI, which is the local chapter of the Transparency International, which for five years we've just come out. I don't have, I don't, I'm not surprised we have slipped. And I think we would even go further once we start exposing more corruption. So, but the same TIGI in Guyana for five years remains silent. The index is, so the index is determined based on openness in society, also on acts of corruption. So let me tell you, we just came out of it election in the last five years in 20 from 2016 to 2018 three years in the last government the, no one had to submit their statements to the integrity commission now in guyana in 2000 when i was president we passed a law which says that every elected official and other senior officials every year have to submit your statements of income and asset to the integrity commission and you have to you the law if you don't you make a, a false declaration you can go to jail for over a year it has a jail term there we have faithfully done that from 2000 year 2000 to 2015 the last government came in three years no no one submitted anything no one submitted. The TIGI local chapter never ever mentioned that because many of them are aligned to the opposition. They never mentioned the trade. We've been exposing it. So I don't have, I can imagine people globally when they're preparing the index going through our newspapers and seeing that we're saying now that the last government for three years did not submit any statements to the Integrity Commission, financial statements. Secondly, we've just charged one of the ministers from the last government for corrupt, a corrupt act. He transferred, although the lawyers advised him not to do so, he transferred a property that is worth about 30, 30 million US dollars for 20 million. One million. That would be about 100,000 US dollars. Transfer title. We've charged him. We have exposed a ton of of her. We spent, after the no confidence motion, without parliamentary oversight in this country, when the last government refused to hold elections, first of all, and we had to go all the way to the Caribbean Court of Justice to force them to hold elections. They had failed, uh, to, the, the Constitution says, three months after the, the passage of a no confidence motion. They spent two billion US dollars without parliamentary oversight. We had no parliament functioning in Guyana for 18 months. What, why wouldn't you think that we wouldn't drop on a, a global perception index um, measurement? You, there's, there are real reasons. Uh, but so we were fighting. Wait, wait, so we were fighting eight, five months after the elections. They refused to leave office. This has to be considered perceived. So there are real issues. That's why I started off by saying there are real issues, we have sought to strengthen the systems. So a proper procurement law, a integrity commission law, all of our financial laws updated, strong penalties for public expenditure, and uh, uh, not utilizing public expenditures for their, their dedicated purposes, et cetera. You, we tried to fix the system. Whether individuals would continue to be corrupt, I, I, I can't put my head on the block. You would have that. But the system has moved forward. But when the system failed, we had systemic failures in the last government because the institution that we put, play, put in place, they never complied with it. The constitution, first of all, for no confidence motion, was not complied with. 
Secondly, the Integrity Commission law was not complied with. And I'm surprised only in 2021 that's going to be mentioned when it happened in 2016 to 2018, when we were in opposition every year shouting about this at the top of our voices. What about within your government? Yes. Do you accept bribes? No, I don't. We've spoken to a number of Chinese business people in Guyana who said that you do accept bribes and they have said that in fact it's the only way to get business done is to bribe you. One Chinese businessman we spoke to involving timber logging told us that basically as long as the vice president is okay with it, it's fine. He just needs to give one phone call to whoever is in charge, they'll get it done right away. The real big boss is the vice president, everything is under the table, the whole country is like this. Yeah, well, I, I can't comment on that because it would be an anonymous person. You can, you can just sit there and fabricate that. As I said before, a lot of the companies and I'm reporters, and well, no, but when, but you can, if you, if you name the person, that's fine. I can, I can, um, any, the, the reporters come from abroad. This is their catch you kind of thing. You always want to make a developing country leader look corrupt. So you have done your, your bit. Um, unless you say who the person is, I can't comment on anonymous people. I can say, as two persons told me before this interview, don't do the interview with, with Vice News because that is precisely what they will do. They okay, will well, fabricate something and come and say they spoke with people here. Well, we're not fabricating yes. anything. But, but I, let's, let's, let's talk about let me, let me, no, but let me get, tell you something. So my, all my statements are in with the Integrity Com Commission. The last government, they checked everything about me and they didn't find anything. They checked my bank accounts abroad, they checked every, everything, they didn't find anything. So there has to be the, the, the evidence of it. But you're not bringing evidence, you're saying an anonymous Chinese source. Okay, well, maybe, maybe, right, may, talk maybe the Chinese company that did not get the, the agreement that they wanted here Maybe they're the ones who told you, or it could be just uh, a, a fictitious thing. Okay, well, let's talk about specific individuals. What is your relationship with Mr. Su Jerome? Su? Oh, Su? My relationship? Nothing. He is he's a tenant in my place, yeah. And he's a good friend of yours? Yes, um, yes, yes. He is a friend of ours. His father was here from many years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he lives next door to you. Yes. Um, yeah. you know, he is able to arrange meetings and catch-ups with you at any point in, in the day. He claims As a friend, that, yeah. He claims that through his very close relationship with you, that he's able to get any deal done. Well, I don't, I don't know and if that's... able to change laws for investors. But, but uh, then which law has been changed for any investor? So Sue, Sue told us that yeah. if you want to get anything done in Guyana, you need some hookups. I'm very close with the vice president and the other mm -hmm. officials. The Vice President and I share a very close relationship. Also, if we do the business, he'll help out no matter what. There's no help, no one else who can help like he does. He also said when he's talking about his yes, but he help. prospect investors that yeah. the Vice President said he can change the constitution, he said he can manage. Everything is going to be done soon. He's really treating us as brothers. He's already trying to help us as much as possible. Of course, I need to give back to him in return. Yeah, but that that is, I don't know about giving back, but I do that to everybody who comes to my office. The American companies come here to, to see me and they need a meeting. You you ask to see me. I'm, I have an open door policy since I was president. So people come to see me. But I've had a long history of being in, in public office and we never had any of this stuff that you talk. And all my accounts are clear. If you are coming here with, with specifics, so I, I just heard what you read, and that's totally accurate. I help out as many people as I can. That's totally accurate what you read there. The, uh, unbelievably accurate. It's accurate. So I help people out, but it doesn't mean for consideration. It does not mean for, for by because I believe that we have a mission to help as many people as possible move forward in this country. Well, Sue also told us that, I mean, the amount will divide between the vice president. It's going to be oh. a service or process. Oh, really? 
if we're going to do business together, my boss is not going to directly receive the money, but obviously it's not going to directly transfer to him. The service charge is 4% of the total. It's not only me, most of it's the vice president. Mm -hmm. Do you use middlemen like Sue in order to take money on, on your behalf so that you can keep your hands clean? No, the answer is no. Why do you think that Sue would say this? I don't know, you have to ask him. I mean, he's saying it because he, as he understands it, that understands that that's the truth. Well, no, as he understands it, so that's why you have to ask him. But the answer is no. So why do you think he's saying this to us? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. You ask him about that. I mean, this is, he's saying that, you know. Yeah, but I just said to you, I don't know. If you're hoping, if you're hoping, if you're hoping. this is how it works. If you're hoping, yes. If you're hoping to, again, to drag me into this, catch me, you know, I got you there. I told you already, no. And I told you already what you said there at the beginning. You read the part. And, and that's pr pretty accurate that I have a lot of people who come here. A ton of people call me about getting this interview with you, uh, people that I don't even know. And and I I left the parliament building because I came here for, for it. It doesn't the it doesn't mean it's for consideration. I do help a lot of people. So if you're looking to catch catch another, you have to get more details. You have to get more details. You have to come with evidence. This is all hearsay. In this country, you could you could say anything, you could say anything. It's it's all hearsay. So you you're saying that Mr. Sue, your close friend who lives yeah, next yeah. door to you, who you know, yeah. meets up with you at any point of the day that he needs, is is lying. Yes, if he told you that, if he told you that, but I'm not saying that he told you that. You're saying that we're lying. I, you could possibly be, but I I don't know if he told you that. It's not true. Sue has shown us very lucrative contracts between himself and Chinese state-run corporations to develop big infrastructure projects in Guyana. He told us that China State Construction Engineering Corporation may help the Chinese company to make a deal. Up to now, they've paid me $500,000. It's not to me, I've taken, I haven't taken a single penny. It's my boss, the vice president. China State, what? China State, Corp it's the um, China State Construct Construction Engineering. China which State which is which company? I don't even know what what contract. China State Construction. It's one of the biggest construction companies in the world. In oil? No, in construction, in in building infrastructure. Well, but but I can't comment because it's not true again. I mean, it's not true. Yes, but it's we've not seen true. that he you know he, he is someone who he's an agent, right? He's someone who negotiates contracts so that you know for foreign companies coming into this. Yeah, I. But it's not true. I, I do so actually, I don't I don't I don't I don't know. You're asking me to, go, to comment on someone whose business basically I don't know about. I don't get involved with him beyond the, the pleasantries and all of that. So, so how could I comment? It's not reasonable to ask, it, ask, ask me to comment on something that I don't know about so don't and know that how, is false. You don't know how Sue makes his money? I don't know how he makes his money. There are a lot of people, a lobbyists and stuff like that here. But if you check our policy making, you would see it's clear. I know. We met with a manager from a Chinese state-run corporation who confirmed that they use individuals like Sue in order to get these deals done, and that they pay them a consulting fee, which essentially serves as a bribe yeah. to individuals like you. We well, I don't know because again, that's all. You're building everything on what you were met and what people told you. I don't know. I can't comment on some anonymous manager now telling you something. I mean, these are, these why, are but why do you want me? Why do you, country, so why do you think? Yes, there, but why do so you think? people are telling us one thing about, you know, yeah, but, the way that deals get done. But it is, is but don't you know, it's a typical thing that that every, every report that comes from abroad, you had to come here to try to prove somebody corrupt, right? You, you're gonna to you're gonna do well. Corrupt. You're gonna do to well if you go back is. and broadcast this. But I I'm not well, I'm not gonna fall into this by getting worked up or anything like that. I know it's fabrication and either from the persons or induced by you. Um, so to so fulfill your mandate when you come here, you have to ensure that somebody looks corrupt. 
I'm um, not trying to make anyone look corrupt. I'm yes. just trying to report on the but, facts. But that exactly, but anybody could anonymously tell you. Yes, but any person can anonymously tell you anything. Anonymous. You expect me to comment on a manager? What he does? Me. What he does with the, uh, with Sue? I, um, how can I comment on a manager who does uh, who does business with Sue when I don't know what is the nature of Sue's business? So why would I why would I want to even comment on this? You you keep trying to get me to do something that I can't simply do. Well, you know. Will you investigate at least? You know, no, 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 definitely not. I'm going to ask about all of this, but I can't. I can't comment reasonably. I, how can I comment on these these issues? So, what will you investigate? I mean, when we send you these details of you know, the yeah, but but but, but, but the best way to do this is not to have me investigate, but let let write the the integrity commission. The integrity commission should get all of this. They should be able to ask. Uh, uh, access what my assets are and then see if they I can't account for any of the assets and it's easy in today's world to find uh, the assets well, anyway. I mean, not necessarily because I mean what Sue is saying is essentially that he's acting as kind of a middleman and as a white glove yeah but uh, ultimately so but keeping your hands clean no but yes but ultimately the assets if you were saying that has to come to the so-called corrupt individual so they have to have a manifestation of the asset somewhere. It has to be kept in a bank account or in stocks or shares or something. So it's easy to check that. It's easy to check that. That is where, if if you were serious, you would start there. And but I can I can go to any place there and talk to people. And there are lots of people who don't like me too because I'm blunt. If I come and I say to you, I can help or I can't help because many of them come and ask for things that are not, we, we never do, like in the forestry sector or in mining or anything like that. I don't, I'll never, help. if I feel there is discrimination or there's corruption at the agency, then I will, will try to get them through the process in a clean manner. And let me tell you, all the companies come here, not just, so when Bechtel comes here, a big US company, they ask to see, see us too. Not because they're paying a bribe. Exxon will come, they'll ask to see me meet me. Not because they're paying a bribe. And they, they can get prosecuted globally. So don't make it look like only the Chinese companies. And in fact I'm not suggesting that No, but Chinese in fact, in fact, I have probably them. met less Chinese companies than American companies coming here. On, on a whole range of issues. Right. Well, I mean, I'm not just saying that. Yes, I, but but you but you realize how you realize how unreasonable it is to ask me to comment. Somebody makes an allegation. You you say, oh, this person told me this, and then expect me to comment on it. What do I say except to say it's not true? Given that there's so much money coming into Guyana at the moment, I mean, how do you make sure that things like money laundering and corruption don't become big issues as they often do in developing countries? This, uh, this is a huge issue. So on the financial side, we we have uh, every five years or so an FSA, a financial sector assessment uh, report done by the IMF. And then we're, our anti-money laundering law is OECD compliant. So we are very, very cautious. The last, the last, um, commercial bank license we issued was since I was Minister of Finance in the 90s. We've been very, very careful about how the financial sector grows. In our total banking system today, although people talk a lot, we only have about 2.5 billion in total deposits. 2.5 billion in total deposits. And I was explaining someone the scale of investments, say from ExxonMobil and the others. They're going to invest $30 billion in the next five years. In our total banking system, aggregate deposit, it's just $2.5 billion. So our banking system is quite shallow. And it is now we comply with all the standards. But as we grow as a country, we have to ensure that we remain compliant, that our financial sector remains compliant. Secondly, there is a spec the, the law provides for the agencies. Now, the last government we had, 
we had established SOCU as the prosecuting arm for the anti-money laundering unit. They converted SOCU into going after politicians. So almost every member of the cabinet had to go into SOCU, but they didn't do a single investigation on money laundering. So now we are trying to repurpose SOCU to go to fulfill the mandate of the, the um, unit. Then we have a financial intelligence unit that does the investigation and the enforcement arm or the prosecuting arm will be, will be so cool. So we're building our systems in place. As I said before, on the budgetary side, it, there are some strong measures, really strong measures that would allow us to, um, to prosecute people should there be no public, uh, no accountability in public expenditure. Do you think, are you concerned that you know, money laundering is an issue in this country? And based on what I see, that it's, that it's flowing into our financial sector, no, because I just pointed out the scale of what we see. And you can match the growth in our banking system to the growth in the economy. I told you earlier at the beginning that our economy grew from, from about $300 million now to about $6, $6 billion. So when we look at the growth in the banking system, it kind of mirrors what is happening. I mean, a, a 2015 study found that the amount of money Guyana lost to money laundering each year was over 500% greater than the amount of money spent on education in the country. And does, doesn't that reflect, you know, that there is potentially yeah. a larger issue? With but again, are those percentages there and the studies. So it depends on how they classify, because how do they quantify money laundering in this case? What happens is that they have this global definition. So if you have somebody who doesn't declare, pay their taxes, full taxes, then that is considered maybe in this study too, part of the proceeds that are laundered. So we do have tax evasion, like many other countries. Our taxes have grown, we've strengthened it. We put a, a revenue authority, strengthen our tax network, etc. But whether we have tax evasion, that's a different matter. On money laundering, it's difficult even for us when we work with it, say even the US as a partner, for them to estimate and they're they're really more into it. You know, they can they can track this, they have specialists to put a figure to that, to put a figure and say it's X, X percentage. So I don't know, I can't comment on the specific issue, but um but I don't we we've seen our banking system fairly stable and the uh, the proceeds flowing through here. Given that Guyana is kind of at this turning point right now, you know, with the recent discovery of oil and you know the surge in, in foreign investment, yeah. where do you think Guyana stands in the next five years, re realistically speaking? Mm -hmm. um, in the next five years, I, we are hoping probably to get our gross domestic um, product up to maybe per capita, maybe to more than double it, it's triple it. Um, that's on and that, that's crucial for, for us, but more importantly, um, it is the things that we promise to people when we campaign. We have to ensure that we keep those promises. That is creating the infrastructure for the future. That is, secondly, ensuring that we don't become totally reliant on oil and gas revenue. So a diversified economy. Agriculture, food security would be important. Three, the, um, the ensuring that we remain, retain our green credentials as we produce fossil fuel. Four, ensuring a top quality education and healthcare for our people. More jobs, greater security in their homes. These are the key issues uh, for us as we move forward. And how, how realistic is it to, to reach those goals, do you think, within the next five to 10 years? I think it, there, we ha have to, and, and that's where if you look at the budget now presented, you will see they're all geared towards achieving those. I think we can achieve those goals. And so those are, those are very important areas for us. It's a very positive outlook. Some would say optimistic, but a positive outlook. Um, I don't believe it's optimistic. I've, I've been around here long enough to know this, um, to know that we now, all of our plans 
that we had in place, now we have a possibility of getting those financed. Um, is the Integrity Commission, is that something that exists already or is that something... No, the Integrity Commission has always existed. The law, whether, they, whether the commission exists or not, doesn't absolve you from submitting your reports. It's a secretariat. So every year you have to file. The commission is about... To, people confuse the secretariat with the commission. So the law is in operation. You have to file. So we have all filed. We have all filed from the cabinet. We have all filed our statements. So now they're in the process of appointing the chairman. I think the president has to consult with the leader of the opposition. Right now, we don't have a leader of the opposition. Okay. Right. <laughs> so he has to consult before that is okay. settled. So, so no. No, no. no, but that does commission. not absolve you from filing. The law is operational, and there is a secretariat that receives your submission and acknowledges the receipt of the submission. You have to file. The and that secretariat was practically disbanded in the last government. Um, the Amila Falls project is the, you know, the, the very large hydroelectric project that's going ahead. This was the deal that you know, we were hearing had, was a rigged deal between the Chinese, uh, the China Rail and uh, a deal that was made with, with you personally. But, but so, so that's why, let's go through. So you're saying that's a, that's a deal that I'm ostensibly influenced. It, it's a deal that we heard from a number of very influential individuals okay. who were involved in that deal, okay. but it was, it, was, it was a rigged deal. Well, influential individuals. So let us go back to the Amila. So the Amila was developed by a subsidiary of Blackstone. They, they were they went out to public tender. This was when when I was president. They selected the a number of people. The country, uh, the same the Chinese company to build the hydro. Then I left office. It continued. The last government stopped the project. When we when we came. When they came into office, Norway was putting in $100 million into the project. The project had been approved by the IDB board, the Inter-American Development Bank board. Then we asked Norway, uh, we, we urged, because the other government was saying there was corruption. So we asked them to get Norway to do an assessment. You can check the assessment done by Norway. Norway said this is the best project to decarbonize the energy sector, the hydro project. So we made it clear in opposition, we're returning. There is no way we can achieve our emission targets globally if we don't go with hydro as part of the base load. So when we got back in office, we retended the project. We retended the project. Now, by that time, the, this company that won the bid on an open process, they won the bid and the lowest price financing. They, they had acquired from, from Blackstone, historically, the, the material, all the drawings and etc. So I suspect that allowed them to put in a better bid. But the, this was the lowest of the, the evaluated bids. So there was, there was no big deal, there was a, no close process when it came to... No, 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 close process. process. Check the newspapers. Advertise. You can check the newspapers and you will see that it was advertised. Mm -hmm. It was advertised. And this was the same contracting firm that won the bid when Blackstone selected them. Mm -hmm. And you can check that historically. And they had all the proprietary stuff, all the drawings, etc. That was why I, I thought that they, their bid was so low compared to the others. And interestingly, that's why I mentioned to you that they came in at three cents per, three US cents per kilowatt hour, lower than if we had gone with Blackstone. So, and, so it's and just a case of pricing and what makes sense. Pricing, and secondly, we were taking, and with us taking no equity in the project, we're just buying power. 
You say that um, you say that Guyana is not that important when it comes to being on the geopolitical stage, but I mean, you know, the U.S. sees South America, including Guyana, as within their own backyard and their sphere mm -hmm, of influence. Mm -hmm, sure. China is increasingly improving their engagement, increasing their engagement in South America, including here as well. I mean, how does Guyana not get caught up in that when tensions between the U.S. and China are so high at the moment? Because we focus on what we have to do. We want to get, we remain friendly with everyone. We ensure that our bidding process is at It's open. hard to, mean, you know, to maintain friendships with everyone when you know, so often the US and China are making people pick sides. I, I don't think we have had an ultimatum from either party to pick sides. And we, we would view such an ultimatum in not a in a friendly way because they need to know that we need everyone in Guyana. Countries like ours need everyone uh, to, to be part of our future. And these countries have, like in the United States, they still import a lot of stuff from China. We have to have relations with China and we have to have relations with the U.S. In the U.S., we, particularly so we are connected more because almost half of our people live there, more than half of our people live there. So there is that closer connection with the United States. And uh, therefore, that's a crucial relationship for us. And now on the investment side, we have seen more and more US companies coming here. So you're not, you would reassure Guyanese people who are concerned that you know, China is increasing their engagement here, that they are you know, recolonization of, of South American countries, including Guyana. But that's not the case. The, no, um, I don't. We don't get involved in that too much. We stay focused on what we have to do at the national level. Um, I know that probably more makes more interest to, in the U.S. perspective and in your news about you know whether we are. Oh, it's just concerns that Guyanese people have brought up. To oh, but no, but them. but I I meet with Guyanese people every day. We we have very inclusive government. We go out a lot and we meet with thousands of people and that has never really surfaced as a big issue about um, maybe in some circles you know the circles that people are accustomed what I call the griping class in the country the griping class and every country has that, that. but then griping class? yes it's a griping class they, they never satisfy with anything like so now we have some trying to shut down Exxon operation here, claiming we are the cause of global warming. Now, I had to point out that if you look at our emission on an annual basis, compared to global emission, it's less than five minutes of global emission for the whole year. But we have a court case filed by that group that's trying to stop operations offshore now, where Exxon saying, that we are contributing to, or we are the cause of climate change. And I think unwittingly they become part of an international agenda, some of the NGOs that want to keep the monopoly for some of the big com companies and, and countries to continue producing oil while they shut down the operations in the small developing countries. You're saying some people are just never satisfied. Not never, and, and it's a tiny group, and they're, they're hangover from the the days when we are undemocratic. So they form themselves into an unaccountable caste. For example, we have a, a, a human rights association here in Ghana. It's a one-man show. And no, no membership meeting, no accountability, nothing. But every week you see a statement being issued from the GHRA. That's the sort of organizations, when you come out of a dictatorship and you're trying to open up society you have this to contend with but we are a free country so they're free to say what they want but they in no way reflect what the public opinion in this country is if you want to know the public opinion you have to go into the rural areas you have to go to talk to people who don't still don't have good quality water and they need that or where their kids can't get um, Wi-Fi as yet so that they can get uh, a, a, an online education. Those are the real people of this country. 
uh, some of the people uh, like that that we talk to definitely want more infrastructure and better roads and better services like that, mm -hmm. but also are concerned that those things will open up their lands and their livelihoods even more to business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. I mean, some of those individuals, the indigenous yes. peoples that we spoke to, you know, they do want infrastructure, they do want better healthcare, they want all these things that we're talking about, but they are also very concerned that their lands, with that, their lands are going to get opened up and for exploitation. Yes, but if you, that's why you have to come to a meeting like where we bring once a year the elected leaders of the community. This is listening to the leaders, they have to contest elections, and you should listen to their list of issues that they bring up at the meeting with the president and the ministers. They want roads, they want to open up some of them or their communities because they say, why should we forever live in huts and other people are enjoying their resources? The young people in those communities. I mean, I think that a lot of them want to stay there, but you know, obviously they want. Yeah, to but if they, they want a better road to to go into the community, so you can drive in, because some of them own vehicles now. They want to drive to the. They want to drive into South Rupanoni. They don't want to walk in or go on a bicycle like in the past. They want to drive into South Rupanoni. So do we not fix the road into South Rupanoni, where you have all of these villages? We are fixing the road. The communities, when you go to the community meeting, they say the road is our priority. So you can always meet a few people um, who say, oh, this is going to open up. That's the old view of indigenous people. The old view of indigenous people, oh, we want to be isolated from everyone. Our indigenous population has opted for integration, but preserving. So that's why we have month long, we now have a month long celebration for preserving culture. We're working on the language, a whole range of stuff. Preserving, but they want, they're the doctors and the lawyers and the accountants now in our society, and they want to live that life. They want to go back home and they want to live in the, in the city too. Sure, I mean, it's a very fine line to go up, right? It's yes, difficult. And, and, and difficult. So Often as an integrator, uh, when, when you're a political people you you go with the overwhelming desire of the village so when you go to the meetings the meetings are not done like here it's it's a person going and saying the community comes out and they say so let's discuss the priorities and they will bring up the road they help to choose what those are they get a grant from the government and often their their grants would be used for infrastructure project the same one that someone one or two persons in the village may not want, that's what the village votes for. So do you think it's inevitable that, you know, in the future, that way of life, that indigenous way of life that, you know, conceived right now in Ghana in the rainforest won't be there but anymore? what indigenous way of life? That's what I'm talking about. Because every one of our kids there, they can speak English, they're going to school, we're paying um, online access. I believe I suppose, you know, they can do that, but they can also live off the land if they want. You know, yes, if they want, if they want. This is not a dictatorship. So sure. people can, that's why they're getting the land titled now to the communities. So that's why I'm saying they have, once you get a title land, it's absolute forever. The community controls it. So if we are going to move from 6% of Guyana to 20% of Guyana, and that will be owned by them, then they have that opportunity to live off the land and utilize the resources if they wish, but if they wish, not because we want to put them as museum pieces, you know, for to satisfy some global perception that these, you know, they're preserving way of life. These are the people must make their own decisions. That's what we believe. The government has to give choices. You know, here you are, if you want to go that route, you, have, you will get our full support. But if you want to integrate, you get the full support too. 